Right, OK. Hello, everyone. Thank you very much for tuning in to HOPS virtual workshop number eight, which is going to concentrate on the HOPS risk assessment uh, system. Uh, if you haven't watched before, then you'll be able to see on the screen uh, a version of HOPS, uh, which is a completely fake version with completely fake data in it. And uh, I'll talk through some of the processes uh, involved in the risk assessment system. Do feel free to ask questions or make comments as we go along in the comments, and I'll try my best to answer them. Uh, as best I can as we go through the video. Uh, if you're watching this video not tonight, if you're watching it not live, then a lot of people report that it is uh, very useful to pause it as you go along and compare what's on the screen to what's in your own uh, version of HOPS. Uh, so please do do that and take advantage of the uh, of the video. It'll be uploaded to YouTube after the, the video ends on Facebook and it'll still be available on uh, HOPS Facebook page afterwards, along with all the other HOPS virtual workshops that we've done on the other aspects of HOPS. Please feel free to let us know if there's something you particularly like us to cover uh, in a future workshop, uh, and we'll do our best uh, to cover it. Uh, right, so uh, the HOPS risk assessment system has come about relatively recently. I'm calling this the beta release uh, of the system, and normally I like to let things bed in quite a lot before I start making uh, videos about them, uh, but in this case, uh, particularly because of the number of uh, railways that have been using the system um, as part of their reopening plans uh, after coronavirus, I've uh, I've brought this forward a little bit. So please feel uh, please uh, forgive me if anything's a little bit uh, flaky around the edge, but do feed that back, and then with your feedback, I'll be able to improve it as we do with everything that's in hops. So first of all, I'd just like to talk a little bit about risk assessments in general. Uh, and why I've uh, built this risk assessment system in HOPS. Now, one of the things I always apply is I don't really like to build something in HOPS if it's not going to add any value or if it's going to be uh, more labor intensive to put something in HOPS than it would have been just to have it on a, a piece of paper or an Excel spreadsheet. And so I had thought about risk assessments and, and several people had discussed risk assessments with me for, uh, for a long time. And I'd always sort of resisted on the basis that I didn't think risk assessments needed to be made uh, any more complicated than they already were. Uh, but eventually I gave into pressure. Eventually I um, decided that we would have a look into if HOPS could improve the risk assessment process, particularly in the context of steam railways um, and heritage centres in any way. And we found that there were quite a lot of places uh, where we thought we could add value. And that's why the risk assessment system came along. So I'd just like to talk um, a bit about uh, risk assessments in general before I talk about specific risk assessments uh, in HOPS first. And one of the things that we identified was um, heritage uh, attractions tend to have a huge, huge number of uh, volunteer staff, um, many of whom might do one day a week or a couple of days a month, um, but overall doing the work of a much smaller number of full time equivalent staff. So in a big um, organization where everybody is employed, the process of doing risk assessments is very different to what it's likely to be like in a volunteer organization. In a volunteer organization, it's likely to be uh, spread out much further. For example, the signaling inspector is likely to do the signaling risk assessments and the footplate inspector is likely to do the footplate uh, risk assessments. Um, but there is nevertheless the same managerial hierarchical structure where everybody has a manager and as the risk flows uphill and gets to the directors at the top who are ultimately responsible for the, uh, the enactment of safety on the railway and the conduct of risk assessments on the railway. Sometimes that information can be presented in lots of different formats because it's come from lots of different people or using lots of different scales. So a 10 in signalling doesn't necessarily mean the same as a 10 on footplate. And I thought, yes, these are places where where hops can add some value to this risk assessment process, where lots of volunteers are doing risk assessments in an organisation and a small number of uh, directors are ultimately responsible for safety. Um, Risk assessments are uh, a requirement. There is no doubt about that. Uh, so I've copied here on the screen the extract from the two laws, the two sets of regulations uh, where we are mandated to do risk assessments. This is the Management of Health and Safety at Work Regulations 1999, which states that every employer shall make a suitable and sufficient assessment of the risks to the health and safety of his employee to which they are exposed whilst they are at work and the risks to the health and safety of persons not in his employment arising out of or in connection with the conduct by him of his undertaking. So the passengers, the visitors, 
um, and everybody else who's not employed. And particularly in the case of railways, it's also mentioned in the ROGS regulations 2006, regulation 19, a transport operator shall make suitable and sufficient assessment of the risks to the safety of any persons for the purpose of identifying the measures he needs to take to ensure safe operation of the transport system in question insofar as this is affected by his operation. So there's no doubt at all that we're required to do these risk assessments. And the wording that particularly stands out uh, to me in these uh, pieces of legislation is suitable and sufficient. And in many ways, unfortunately, I found um, through what I've seen and what I've spoken to uh, people who um, are responsible for the safety on, on heritage railways about is that often we sometimes are a little bit guilty of doing risk assessments because we have to and not actually for the purpose of assessing risk. And those risk assessments could not be said to be sufficient. So we've done a lot of work in HOPS to try and make the process an actual risk assessment process, a process for assessing risks rather than a process for saying we've done a risk assessment. Um, we've got, uh, oh yes, uh, thank you, uh, Alex. Uh, so, some other uh, people watching. Good evening, Mel Clark, who I think is from the Alm Valley Railway. Uh, good evening, Richard Lemon. Thank you very much, Richard, for all the help you've given us in the development of the risk assessment system here. Hello, Ben Greening from the South Devon Railway. Uh, right, let's look at a uh, what we might consider to be a conventional 5x5 risk assessment um, matrix. And uh, in many cases, this is this is sort of risk assessment level one. And it's certainly better than nothing. Don't get me wrong. If this is the risk assessment that you do at the moment, then I'm not saying it's, it's wrong or bad. I'm just saying going to say that there are some uh, anomalies in it. First of all, the definitions of very low, low, medium, high and very high could be very subjective, especially if risk assessments are being done by different people with different um, expert knowledge, with different skill sets in different departments of the railway. Um, so what I might consider to be something that's high, somebody else might consider some uh, to be low, especially if it's being risk assessed um, in a more high risk environment. So a very high risk in an office environment might actually be lower than what's considered a low risk on a steam footplate where all of the risks are naturally a little bit higher. So we tried to do some work to um, uh, to make a bit more quantifiable these definitions of low, very low, medium high, uh, very high. Uh, there are also some uh, anomalous results that you can get from a 5x5 five five matrix, even when you apply some definitions, as I've done here to the severity, uh, to what 1, 2, 3, 4 and 5 could actually mean. By numbering these uh, severities, 1, 2, 3, 4 and 5, and then giving them uh, definitions such as I've done, it implies a, a linear increase in severity from one to five. We're implying by um, the activity of getting a, a mathematical score out of this that a medium injury, which we've scored as a three, is three times worse than a minor injury. And that a major injury, which we've scored as a four, is twice as worse as, a, as several minor injuries, because a major injury is a four and several minor injuries is a two. And most starkly of all, that we're saying that a death is worth five and a minor injury is worth one, which puts five minor injuries uh, on a par with a death, which almost certainly um, isn't true. So the number scores one, two, three, four, five, we found aren't always the most appropriate scores to give these severities. And in many cases, the increase in severity um, when expressed as a number is almost a logarithmic um, increase um, in value. Uh, hello to uh, some uh, new viewers who've joined in. Hello to Kev Goodsell from the Kenton East Sussex Railway. Hello, Jamie Brooker from Romsey Signalbox. Good evening, Kev Goodsell. We hope you find the, the video uh, useful. Um, so five by five matrix. I'm certainly not saying it's terrible, but I am definitely pointing out that there are some shortcomings uh, in the matrix. Um, there's another issue uh, that we uh, discovered uh, in development um, and the discussion of the HOPS risk assessment system, which is that there are many different uh, types of severity. So an example I like to use is if I was to risk assess um, uh, the supply of coal on the railway, which is a topical uh, subject at the moment. 
And if I was going to risk assess it, and I'm a I'm from a safety background, I could say that the severity of running out of coal in terms of safety is pretty low. Because, in fact, if we're not running trains because we've run out of coal, we might even be actually safer than when we were running trains. So I would score that one a fairly low severity. But if I was the commercial manager and I had to risk assess the severity of running out of coal, I'd assess that severity as very high. Because if we can't run trains, we can't make money, we can't be commercial and suddenly our business becomes unviable. But with a five by five matrix, I can only give it one impact severity. If I give it an impact severity very low, because I've assessed it from a safety point of view, uh, then the day that we do run out of coal, the commercial manager might say, well, hang on a minute, how come this wasn't on the, on the risk assessment system? How come this wasn't a high risk that I could have been aware of all this time? And suddenly we've hidden uh, what is actually a very high risk commercially. Or if we scored it very high to satisfy that commercial high risk, then the day we run out of coal, uh, sorry, then the safety manager might look at his um, risk assessments and see this very high risk and go, oh my goodness me, this is a high risk. Oh, running out of coal, no, that's not a high risk at all. And lots of false positive high risks could mask the real high risks that the safety manager should be concerned about. So another thing that we've incorporated into HOPS is being able to assess a risk on many different um, impact severities. And generally those impact severities align with the um, director areas of the railway who are actually ultimately responsible for the, um, the discharge of the railway and its, its uh, viability as a business and its safety. So I'm gonna show you now a tree of how the risk assessment structure um, is built up in HOPS. Um, it starts on the left hand side in the organization. So that might be the, the particular railway that you're on. And within the organization, there will be several hazard groups. And the hazard groups form two, uh, are there for two purposes. One, just to nicely group the hazards together um, into, into manageable groups, but also in hops for the purpose of allocating permissions. So the hazard groups should ideally be the groups of people who are going to be conducting the risk assessment. So if you've got a team of footplate um, inspectors and they're going to do the footplate risk assessments, then a hazard group of loco or footplate um, would be ideal. And then another one for signal boxes and another one for cafe and another one for workshop and another one for admin. That's ideally how the hazard groups would be arranged. Within each hazard group lives all the hazards. And a hazard, just before we go any further, the definition of a hazard, certainly as far as the HOPS risk assessment system is concerned, is a thing or an activity that takes place or uh, a thing that exists that has the potential to give rise to a risk. So on a loco, a hazard might be the hot equipment or the working at height. And in a signal box, the hazard might be the levers or the steps. It's not a negative outcome in its own right. It's something that exists or an activity that takes place that has the ability to give rise to a risk. Each hazard can have many risks. So a risk arising from hot equipment could be burns or a risk arising from working at height could be a fall. A risk is a negative or potentially negative outcome arising from a hazard. So a hazard group contains many hazards. A hazard can contain many risks. And as we mentioned earlier in our example about running out of coal, a risk could have many different impacts. So in the examples I've given here, I've said that there could be a safety impact, a financial impact, or a regulatory impact. These are the impact areas that you can define in HOPS and should ideally match the responsible director areas um, in order to maintain that hierarchical structure where the risk analysis flows up to the top and flows up to the director. And lastly, on the very right hand side of this tree, which we haven't mentioned yet, is control measures. Control measures that either reduce the likelihood of a risk leading to an impact or mitigate the severity of the impact once it occurs. So wearing a harness when you're working at height reduces the risk of a fall. Having a crash mat on the ground reduces the impact when you fall. And of course, all sorts of different control measures are appropriate for different uh, types of risks and different environments. It's almost certainly not appropriate to have crash mats around a steam locomotive just in case you fall off, but there will, um, almost certainly be other control measures um, that uh, can be uh, implemented to reduce the likelihood of somebody falling off the top of a loco, such as proper training and holding on and three points of contact uh, and that sort of thing.
So let's look at the hops risk assessment process itself now. And we might come back to this tree just because it's an important tree in remembering the structure of how this risk assessment process um, has been built up. Uh, the risk assessment system in hops lives, it, whoops, lives in this menu on the right hand, on the left hand side under risk assessments. And the first page is a sort of a dashboard of the top risks that we've got. And on the left hand side, remember, this is the demo railway, the railway that I always use for um, uh, doing the, these uh, examples and taking screenshots and things. So DR is the initials of the organization. So the top 20 DR risks, the top 20 demo railway risks are shown on the left hand side here. And then for each of the impact areas, for each of the director areas, the top three risks are shown on the right hand side. And just like everything else in HOPS, um, you only get to see what you've got permission to see. So if you only have got permission to see the financial risks, if you are only concerned or one of your users is only concerned with the financial risks, they will only have the financial uh, table on the page. So it doesn't get cluttered up with things they're not interested in, but we've got everything here. Again, you get to specify what those uh, impact areas are, what those director areas um, are. So just before we uh, go into uh, hazards, I'll just draw your attention to this tab over here, definitions and settings, because it is necessary to put these uh, settings in before you can launch into using uh, the system on your own version of HOPS. So in definitions and settings, the first tab is definitions. There's all the definitions, some of which I've already uh, mentioned uh, today. But what we certainly found was that there was a lot of discussion and a lot of deliberation over the definitions of uh, what meant what in terms of risk assessment. So these are the ones that HOPS has used. Um, more than happy to discuss them if anybody uh, wants to. The next tab is the hazard groups. And remember, we said that these should ideally align with the director areas because these are what the risks are going to filter up to eventually in that triangular hierarchical uh, format. And this is also how the permissions are going to be uh, allocated in hops. So things like I've got there operating station A, I put obviously you'd put the name of your station, uh, museum, cafe, workshop. Those are the sort of things that we're looking for for hazard groups. But however you want to divide it up is up to you. You might have uh, separate steam and diesel or you might have um, separate parts of the workshop if you've got um uh, a workshop that concentrates on woodwork and a workshop that concentrates on painting and a workshop that concentrates on wheels. Um, if all of those risk assessments are going to be done separately, then ideally there would be separate hazard groups um, in hops to make the permissions easier to arrange. It doesn't make any difference whatsoever to the scoring, which hazard group a hazard appears in is only there for the purpose of arranging things nicely. Uh, good afternoon, good evening to Alan Cash from the South Devon Railway Footplate Department and to Paul Michael Evans from the Mid Norfolk, I believe. Please correct me if that's wrong, Paul. Apologies, but I'm pretty sure uh, from the Mid Norfolk. Hello and thank you very much, everyone, for tuning in. Uh, right, the next tab, impact areas and severity values. Here's where I specified what my impact areas are, and I've put safety, financial, regulatory and environmental, which are just ones that I, uh, you know, dreamt up that seem to be used fairly frequently. But uh, you can put in whatever impact areas you want. And those are the impact areas against which the severity of risks is going to be um, uh, um, assessed and analysed. For each impact area, you get to specify a scale of uh, severity impact and you can have as few or as many impact uh, ratings as you like and you can give them whatever value you like. But it is worth having a look and I'll move it so it's on the screen and I'll hold it there on the screen. Uh, sorry, I'll go a little bit a uh, little bit further so you can see that these. Um, uh, these impact uh, ratings uh, we thought about quite a lot and we thought about with a, with a few railways that uh, were early users of the system and uh, settled on this, uh, this sort of numbering. You can put in whatever numbers you like, but I think my recommendation would be to do something similar um, to this numbering sequence. Um, so at the top, the safety uh, impacts, um, you can see we've got the same wording, distress, one minor injury, several minor injuries, major injuries and deaths. But the value no longer goes one, two, three, four, five. The value goes one, ten, a hundred, two hundred, two thousand. And hopefully that normalizes each of those um, impacts against each other. Would we rather have or would we say that it's equal to have 10 people in distress? 
to one minor injury. I'd probably say that's around about right. Uh, 10 minor injuries or, oh, sorry, several minor injuries. Okay, that one doesn't quite work mathematically. But several minor injuries versus one major injury, we've gone double. We've gone 100 to 200. So would I rather have several minor injuries twice is roughly equal to one major injury. And the death there worth 2,000, so a death is equivalent to 2,000 people in distress or 10 major injuries. You can see how this scale has been worked out so that everything is, uh, everything is appropriate in terms of the number that it earns. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 is not appropriate here. 1, 10, 100, 200, 2,000, an almost logarithmic scale, which hopefully balance out, balances out what's worth what in terms of the, um, the impact severity. Financial was really easy to do because we have a brilliant system for measuring financial impact and it's called pounds. So you can see there exactly we've given it a value for each hundred pounds that it is. So again, we went 110, 100, 200, 2000. And we used exactly the same number values as we used in safety. You don't have to do that at all, but we just found that it worked quite well. We did almost the same in regulatory. We went internal inquiry, local authority scrutiny, prohibition notice, ORR or HSE improvement notice, uh, prosecution, ORR or HSE prohibition notice. And we went 110, 100, 200, 200, 500. I think I've gone a bit wrong there. But you can see that the numbers increase proportional to the severity of the um, uh, of the regulatory impact. And hopefully they are roughly correlating with the value of the equivalent financial impact or safety impact. Um, and finally, are you sure you've got the hang of it by now? Environmental down the bottom here in terms of the length of uh, impact and how severe an incident it is and the scores, different score values here. Um, but, but you can see that if I was to compare a financial risk against a safety risk or a regulatory risk against a financial risk, the outcome scores would hopefully be normalized against each other um, and be appropriate for sorting into a list of what was my uh, top risk uh, to look at. So worth a bit of thinking about, more than happy to help anyone out who wants to, um, uh, who wants some help in sorting that out. There is a link to some examples here, and I don't know whether it's going to show, no, uh, it might do. Uh, that here on the help and video tab in the top right hand corner, and I've colored it in just so that it's clear that that's not what's in your system, that's some examples, and there's the examples that I just uh, talked about. Uh, I don't know whether it's going to, yes, it's going to work. Brilliant. Um, okay, so impact areas, just to confirm, are the um, are where the, uh, the, the risk is going to hierarchy up to, ideally aligned with the director areas, and for each impact area, you can specify what you want the options to be in terms of a severity um, of impact. On to the next setting, the affected parties, standard risk assessment, who's affected. You can put in as many uh, options as you like there. And again, through early testing of this, we found that initially we um, suggested options like um, staff, public, visitors, contractors, line-side neighbours, level crossing users, for example. But pretty quickly, we established it was useful to break staff down into the actual staff roles. And although that means you have a lot more entries in the list where you have signalmen, drivers, guards, museum, platform, cafe, admin, P-Way, S&T, all these different um, staff and departments uh, on the railway, it was useful to allocate the risks in that way because it makes it a lot easier at the end to print out a list of all the risks that affect signalmen or all the risks that affect P-Way persons and give them that list and what the control measures are. Um, and doing risk assessments is one thing, but unless people are aware of what those risks are and what the control measures are in place that they're either supposed to be observing or, or working to, um, it's, it's a bit pointless if they're not aware. So we pretty quickly uh, realized that having lots of affected party options so that each individual role um, in the organization could be individually allocated uh, was really, really useful. And finally, in terms of settings, exposure settings, we're all familiar uh, with um, a risk assessment matrix where we multiply likelihood by severity to get a mathematical outcome. But that doesn't always work on things where the exposure to the hazard itself is either very low or very high or certainly disproportional to other things that we're um, 
analyzing. So in the HOPS risk assessment system, it's not impact times severity, it's impact times severity times exposure. To give an example of that, if we do the, uh, the risk assessment uh, for um, evacuating trains in an emergency, oh, which is in fact the example that it gives up the top there in the definition. Uh, if I had to evacuate a train in an emergency and get ladders and get people onto the ballast and I assessed the risk arising from that, the risk of somebody injuring themselves from falling off the ladder, I would say that the, the safety impact could be quite high, especially if they landed on their head or landed on the rail or something like that. And I would say that the likelihood is probably fairly high as well. If I had to evacuate a train with 300 people on it, especially if it's a bit of a panic or if it's raining, I would say the chances are one of them is probably going to fall off the ladder if I've got 300 people to do. So we're saying the likelihood is quite high as well. So if we're saying that uh, both the likelihood and severity of somebody injuring themselves when we evacuate a train in an emergency is so high, why do we accept it? Well, we accept it because our exposure is so low. It's so very rare that we have to evacuate a train in an emergency. I'm sure it will have been done on a heritage railway at some point, but I struggle to think of a, um, of a specific example. So even though the likelihood time severity is really high, the exposure is really low, and that makes it um, a palatable risk for the business to bear. We don't do it very often. We only do it when we absolutely have to, and we accept that the, the, the risk we accept when doing it is that maybe somebody will fall off the ladder, but it's probably the least worst option than staying on the train in whatever the circumstances are. The exposure settings will become more clear uh, when we do an example risk assessment uh, in a moment. Some exposure settings are in terms of a number of units per day or week or month or year, which is obviously a fixed period of time. And some of the exposure settings are variable to the organisation. So number of operating days, number of trains operated, number of visitors. If we have a risk where the exposure is proportional to the number of days that we operate, and this year we operate on 220 days, we might analyse that risk and it might come out acceptable. <clears throat> Next year we run on 365 days, so that's a 50% increase in the number of days that we're operating. The activity that we're doing and the likelihood that somebody's going to get injured and the risk, um, uh, the severity impact is exactly the same, but because it was proportional to the number of days that we were operating on, and we're now operating on half as many days over again, actually that risk has moved massively up the agenda uh, for how much attention we should give it. A really good example is this year, COVID year, where a lot of us haven't run trains for the last six months. A lot of the risks that are proportional to the number of days that we operate are going to have gone down, down, down because we're not operating on so many days. And therefore, proportionally, other risks might have overtaken them. The risks that are proportional to the number of days that we don't operate has gone up, up, up. The risk of vandalism, the risk of trespass, um, the risk of trees falling onto the line, the risk of stations getting burgled, that sort of thing, is probably proportional to the number of days when we don't operate, the number of days when a trespasser sees that there are no trains running. So this year, those risks will have gone up, 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 up. And without going and having to reassess every individual little risk, we can come here to the risk exposure settings, alter the number of days that we operate or the number of trains or the number of visitors or whatever the setting is. And the risk assessment scores will reorder themselves based on these new exposure settings. Hello to Tom Bailey from, I think, the Etchells Wood Railway. Uh, was late off work and he'll watch on Catch Up later. Excellent idea. The video will be available on Facebook later and also on uh, YouTube, along with all the other Hops Live workshops that we've done. Right. OK, I think I've uh, talked to death about uh, the settings, but unfortunately, you do have to go through the settings and set them up uh, before you can use the risk assessment system. Remember that here in the help tab, which is also where the video will be, uh, is the example uh, severity impact uh, settings that I uh, that I spoke about earlier. Um, I'll go to this second tab here, this hazards tab. This is where all the hazards live. Here's my hazard groups, cafe, museum, operating and station A. Remember, it makes no difference to the score outcome how I uh, arrange the hazards into groups. It's only so that they're arranged nicely in the list and so that permissions can be arranged in hops for who has permission to see and edit uh, what they have permission to see and edit. And I'm going to add a new uh, hazard. So I'll add it in the operating uh, hazard group simply because uh, it hasn't got any at the moment. 
And I'm going to do the risk assessment for passengers riding in goods brake vans. You know, something that we might do on a gala quite a bit, and it deserves a risk assessment. So we get to specify a headline, and we get to specify a bit of a description to give a bit more detail about what we're uh, assessing here. So uh, passengers uh, will be allowed to ride in goods brake vans for short journeys up and down the platform during the summer gala. Or whatever description that you want to give it uh, is totally up to you. Now here's where we specify uh, the exposure. The exposure is how frequently does the hazard or activity take place? And we're gonna say that the summer gala is a weekend long, so that's two times per year. If we're assessing the risk on a daily basis, it'll be two times per year. Um, or we could, uh, yeah, let's leave it at that. We'll say that we're going to assess the daily risk from passengers riding in good brake, goods brake bands, and that occurs on two days per year. You can see that you can specify it by any time period, calendar day, week, month, year, 10 years. And then underneath that is the non-time specific but organization specific units of exposure, such as the number of operating days, the number of trains operated, or the number of visitors. And whatever else you think of in terms of a thing that exposure can be proportional to, let me know and I'll add it in that list because the chances are other organizations will benefit from it as well. So we're gonna say that this is gonna occur twice per year. We're gonna assess the daily risk. We could choose if we wanted, just to go off on a little tangent, we could say we're gonna assess it per trip and we're going to run 10 trips a day. So that would be 20 units per year. You can assess it in terms of whatever you want, but it is important to recognize that mathematical um, numerical exposure value. Um, oh, uh, Alistair Baker has asked, can the hazards tab list in the order you set them up? Can the hazards tab list in the order you set them up? Uh, oh, is this a question of just the order in which the... Um, uh, the hazard groups are shown. I imagine they look alphabetical to me, um, but if you want them in a specific order, um, let's talk about that. And I wonder whether if I have a look, it's always worth having a little dig around in hops to see what you can find. Oh, there is an order setting here. There is an order setting, so you can specify the order uh, that you want them to appear in. And if you don't specify an order, then it'll be um, alphabetical. So you can specify an order there. Sorry, Alistair, if that wasn't your question, please feel free to ask it again. But I think that's um, I think that's the question is about the order the um, uh, the hazard groups show up. Uh, OK, next in our risk assessment, parties affected. So this time we'll say passengers. Just so that at some point in the future, we can obtain a list of all the hazards that impact on uh, passengers. So hopefully this is all easy so far. Certainly I have found in the past when we mention the word risk assessment, sort of the whole room goes to sleep because not because necessarily of the difficulty of assessing risks, but the difficulty of thinking, oh, how do we assess risk? What structure do we use? What's the process? And hopefully by laying it all out on the page like this, it enables a nice step by step process for someone to go through so they don't have to think about what the, the structure of risk assessment is. They only have to think about the scores they want to give it and they let the system take care of um, calculating the values. Right, let's add a risk to the hazard or activity of passengers riding in goods brake vans. So I think the, uh, the first um, uh, risk that we will add is a passenger could fall out. Passenger could fall out of a, of a brake van. And we get to specify the likelihood of this risk occurring per occurrence of the hazard without any control measures. And remember, it's per occurrence of the hazard. The hazard or activity is passengers riding in good brake vans. So for every day that that occurs, because we said we were going to assess it in terms of days, how likely is it without control measures that somebody will fall out? Well, I suspect that if there wasn't a barrier across the, uh, the, the walkway and there wasn't uh, uh, you know, a guard in the brake van making sure that people don't get too close to the edge and be silly, I'd say it's probably fairly good chance that somebody's going to fall out. And you'll see here this is expressed in terms of a one time in a number of occurrences and then in brackets afterwards also the percentage chance. So I'm going to say that without any control measures at all, I reckon there's probably a 50% chance that somebody will fall out. 
And if I want to, I can specify some detail here. And then here are my four uh, impact areas and the impact severity values that I specified for each one. And you see that you're not uh, stuck to a list, uh, sorry, to a fixed number of uh, severity values. So for regulatory there, I've got six, whereas for the others, I've only got five. They all start by default on their highest setting. So if you do nothing, they will come out massively high. Better that than for them to come out massively low and to hide something that's actually very high. So the safety impact of a passenger falling out, I guess it could be a death, but I'm going to go major injuries. Got to go for the most likely um, impact severity. The financial impact, if somebody fell out and had major injuries, I'd say probably at least £10,000 of um, uh, clearing up to do from that. The regulatory impact, my, you might find yourself with a prohibition notice if you didn't have any control measures in place to stop uh, passengers falling out of brake bands that you were letting them ride in. And the environmental impact, no impact at all, I would say. We're not going to end up with any um, you know, oil spillages into rivers or anything like that. This is one risk arising from the hazard of passengers uh, riding in brake bands. But remember, we said that one hazard could have many risks. So I'll add a new risk and another set of boxes appear exactly the same as the ones above for me to put my next risk in. So my next risk, I would say, from passengers riding in brake bands could be. Arms out and things like that. Yeah, people putting their arms out and things like that. Passengers um, leaning out and waving their arms. OK. I want to put flailing, but I'm not going to put that. So again, likelihood of the risk um, occurring. Oh, sorry, slight error here. This isn't a, this isn't a risk, is it? This is this is an activity. The risk is passengers getting injured from leaning out and waving their arms. Important to make that distinction between what's the hazard and activity and what's the risk arising from that hazard and activity. So the risk is passengers getting injured. Likelihood of it occurring without control measures. Again, people are pretty silly sometimes, aren't they? So I'm going to say a 50% chance. No, just so that you can see it does work, I'll say 35% chance just to make sure we get different numbers out of this. Safety impact could be a major injury. Financial impact. Again, I'd say a good £10,000 to mop up all the, um, the outcome of uh, somebody getting injured in that way. Uh, again, maybe even a prohibition notice. If uh, if the ORR felt that our brake band rides were that unsafe, they could issue with us a notice to tell us to stop doing it until we've uh, sorted out how we can do it safely. And again, the environmental impact, probably no impact at all. I've had enough of uh, adding risks to this particular hazard now, so I'll press save. And here is my um, hazard page for the hazard of passengers riding in goods brake vans. Here at the top is all the details uh, relevant to the hazard or activity. And here's the two risks arising. Risks arising from passengers riding in goods brake vans. One, a risk of a passenger could fall out. Its likelihood, uncontrolled, which is all we've looked at so far, is 50%. Its safety impact is major injuries, which we said scored a 200. Its financial impact, 10,000 pounds, which we said scored a 100. And its regulatory impact, uh, prohibition notice, which we said scored a 100. Up the top here somewhere, here's where we specified the exposure. And we said this hazard or activity occurs two times per year. So the equivalent annual exposure instances is two. Really easy to work that one out. But if we'd said it had occurred two times per day, our equivalent annual exposure instances would be 730 something, whatever uh, that number of instances is per year. Or if we said it occurred once per hour, then it would be 24 times 365 um, occurrences per year. So the scores that we've got so far are the exposure, which is two, times the likelihood, which is 50%, times the safety impact, which is 200, to give us an outcome score of two, the HOPS annualized risk score. And everything across HOPS will be annualized, so the score will be per year, um, and it will be based on the exposure times the likelihood times the safety impact. Sorry, slight thing there. It's the impact times the severity times the likelihood divided by 100, just to bring the numbers down into a, uh, a manageable um, uh, a manageable. Uh, magnitude. And I don't know if it will show up on the video, but if you mouse over the score, it gives you a little pop-up box to say how the score was arrived at. 
Uh, so in this case, 2 times 50% times 200, all divided by 100, uh, and then it uh, transposes in the numbers, and then it says equals 2. Uh, and exactly the same applies down here. Risk of passengers getting injured from leaning out and waving their arms, 35% likelihood of happening, major injuries, so just to mouse over again, and annual exposure instances of 2 times a likelihood of 35%, times a severity score of 200, all divided by 100 just to make the number manageable, gives a score of 1.4. So we can already start to see how this is giving us these nice measured numerical outcomes that hopefully are a lot more meaningful than they were in the olden days of the 5x5 matrix. All of these scores that we've done so far have been uncontrolled, and that's why we're looking down this left-hand side of the table here. Uh, we're going to add some control measures in. Uh, we're going to add some control measures in um, uh, to see what that does to our scores. So up the top here, I'll go show control measure editing options in this link at the top. And I'll go edit control measures. Now, here's the thing about control measures. Uh, when we do a risk assessment and uh, we identify a risk and then we say this is a control measure that we're going to um, have in place, we are committing ourselves to providing that control measure. And it is certainly possible, and I've certainly seen it happen before, where somebody in a, a heritage environment does a risk assessment, writes down a control measure on a risk assessment, which actually probably wasn't a very sensible control measure, and subsequently something happens, the risk assessment gets looked at and only then do the directors of the organisation who are responsible for safety become aware of what they've been committed to in terms of delivering this control measure. So there are two ways of adding control measures into risk assessments in HOPS. This way that you can see on the screen contains all of the existing control measures that have already been accepted into the system. And I should imagine that after the initial wave of everybody doing uh, risk assessments, it might be a good idea to restrict risk assessment control measures to only those in the list, only those that the organization is already committed to providing. The second way is the control measure I want isn't listed, so I'll create a new one. And as I say, after the initial wave of everybody putting risk assessments in, probably a good idea to restrict who can add new control measures um, down to senior managers so that we can't get trapped into um, being committed to a control measure that we don't actually want to be committed to. So I'm going to select one or two control measures and I'll just select a few at random. I tick the box here and then I press update. And those, ah, and then I'm taken to a page where I'm asked to reassess the likelihood, because I said this was a control measure to reduce likelihood, once those control measures are in place. So now I'm assessing the controlled score. So it's asking me, here's the hazard details up the top, to assess the likelihood of a passenger could fall out, which was the risk that I specified, for each instance of passengers riding in goods brake vans, with control measures in place. And those are the control measures that I just uh, specified. I realize that they're not, uh, not very realistic control measures. So I'm gonna say that's gone down from a 50% chance to a 10% chance and I'll press save. Here we are back on the hazard page again. Here's the headlines of the control measures that I just added and there's my new controlled score. And you'll notice that because the likelihood has gone from 50% down to 10%, all of the final scores uh, should now be one fifth, in fact, of what they were. And that's true because it's gone down from two to 0 0.4. If I mouse over the um, score again, it'll be two because the annual exposure of instances has not changed times 50 percent times 200. Uh, sorry, uh, times 10 percent times 200 all divided by 100 to give me a score of uh, 0 0.4. Uh, I'm going to click add edit control measures on the safety impact now. So now I'm reducing an impact and because we always uh, in hops, we always assess things differently for each impact area. The control measures will be different for each impact area as well, because something that reduces the safety impact is not necessarily going to reduce the financial impact or vice versa. So I'll go edit control measures on the safety impact. 
And this time the control measure I want isn't listed, so I'm going to create a new one, and I'm not sure what mitigation measures I could put in for once somebody has fallen out, because remember, we're reducing the impact this time, we're not reducing the likelihood. I'll be very silly and I'll put uh, crash mats in the sets. And again, I can put a, um, a description in if I want, and I can also, uh, oh dear, I can select a responsible owner, but I'm very sorry at the start, I didn't uh, populate the list of responsible owners. So a responsible owner in this case should be a role rather than a name. It should be something like the S&T manager or the railway manager or the operating director or, or whatever it's going to be. But a responsible owner in there just so that somebody's responsible for managing and reviewing and making sure that this control measure um, continues to be appropriate. <clears throat> and I'll press save and I'll get taken to a very similar page that again asks me to assess a controlled score. This time it's for an impact rather than a likelihood because I said this was a control measure to reduce impact. So this is once the, uh, the risk has occurred, what mitigates how severe it is rather than something that reduces the likelihood of the risk occurring in the first place. So I know it's very silly. I put crash maps in the CES and I'm going to say that reduces the impact severity down from major injuries to one minor injury. And as always in the risk assessment system, I can write a commentary in there uh, if I want to, just to explain how I arrived at the score that I did. Excuse me. And I press save. Here's that control measure to reduce safety, uh, to reduce safety impact severity that I just added. There's my little commentary that I put in, and there's my new score, which is now a 10 instead of a 200. So you can see this controlled score is getting lower and lower and lower. Right, I'm going to say that I'm happy now with all the control measures that I've uh, put in, and I don't really want to uh, edit this risk assessment any further. I'm quite happy with what it's uh, with what it's got in it. I've done all the impact areas that I need to. At the bottom here, incidentally, is the full text of each of the control measures that I've selected above. Up here, it just shows the headline, but down here, you can see the full text uh, detail, if one has been added, which obviously here it hasn't. I've decided I've, uh, I've done all I want to do on this risk assessment now. And what you might have noticed up the top is this yellow banner that says draft only. This risk assessment is draft only and not considered in force. Everything I've done up to now has just been in draft. This hasn't affected any of the scores of, uh, of risks on those, uh, on those headline pages. So I can fiddle around with this as much as I like and I can discuss with other people and I, I can do whatever I like um, without um, giving a, a false or, or draft reading to the overall um, uh, lists of risk assessments in the organization. But when I'm ready, when I've finished, I'm going to press this button here, which says enable checking. And we're going to go through the first of two checking processes that take place to a risk assessment before it's considered sort of accepted. So I'll press enable checking. And I don't know if you'll be able to see it on the screencast, but a little box will pop up to say, are you sure you wish to allow this risk assessment to be checked? Once it has been checked, no further changes can be made to this version. I might have a subsequent version, but to this version, I'm sort of submitting it for checking. So I'll press OK. And you can see it now says awaiting checking. <clears throat> now, the idea at this stage, governed by a different permission, is that somebody else with subject matter knowledge. So maybe if this risk assessment was done by the, um, the guards inspector, this might be an assistant guards inspector or a senior guard or somebody else with with expert knowledge of what's being assessed. Uh, we'll come along uh, and look in hops and we'll go, ah, oh, yes, I'll have a look over this risk assessment in order to see if I have any comments, want to peer review it, uh, see if I can think of anything uh, that looks out of place. And just to briefly go back to the index up here on the top of the index, because I've got permission to, to do the checking, risk assessments awaiting attention. And there's one that's awaiting checking, uh, which I can do. Uh, so I'll have a check and I will be putting interlocking into hops to make it so that the same person who constructed the risk assessment can't be the person who checked it. But I haven't put that in deliberately at the moment because it makes it very difficult to demonstrate. So at the moment, it's going to be the same person who does the checking that does the uh, that constructed it, which is me. But as I say, I am going to put interlocking in to make sure that that can't take place. Down at the very bottom of the page, deliberately at the bottom to make sure that you must have at least looked at it down as far as the bottom of the page is the markers checked uh, button. So putting myself in the mind frame of the checker now, not the original person who did the risk assessment. I'll press markers checked. A little box will pop up to say, are you sure you wish to mark the risk assessment as checked? 
and it will say my name checked by Danny Scroggins and I'll press yes. And now the risk assessment is waiting approval. So the first stage is checking. The second stage is approval. And the approval is designed to go up a level. It's designed to go to maybe the operating manager or the railway manager or the engineering manager or somebody who is more senior than the person who did the risk assessment. Not quite as high up as the director level for each of the impact areas, but certainly a level of management up from the person who did the risk assessment in the first place. And again, controlled by a separate uh, set of permissions. So you can see now we're still on draft of version one and we're now in awaiting approval. Uh, Roger Rowe has just asked, how will a guards assessor evaluate the financial impact? Well, hopefully anybody who's doing risk assessments uh, in an organisation will have received some sort of guidance or training uh, from the organisation in how to do those risk assessments. It may not always be 100% possible for a guard to be able to put a number of pounds on a uh, financial impact, but it would also not be possible for an accountant or a finance manager to have expert subject knowledge of the, um, the activities that a guard does. So there's got to be a bit of um, professional judgment here and hopefully the checking and approving process um, will weedle out anything that's uh, massively different. Um, so, uh, so yes, if a guard thinks that something will not be very expensive and puts it in as a low score, hopefully the checking and approving process will go, well, hang on a minute, that doesn't look, uh, that doesn't look very realistic and we'll edit that. Um, unfortunately, it's not possible to have uh, intimate knowledge of absolutely everything um, unless I guess you're a particularly small organisation and only one person is going to do um, all of the risk assessments. Hello, Liz Parks from the uh, North Yorkshire Moors Railway. Thank you very much for tuning in. So we're now awaiting approval on this risk assessment. And again, it'll be a separate set of permissions to do the approval, but it works in exactly the same way as the checking did, which is the approver comes along. And if I go back to the index, I'll see there in risk assessments awaiting attention. Again, I've got permission to do it because for the sake of this, I've got all the permissions and it says they're awaiting approval. So if I go into the, uh, the risk assessment again, and again, I've put it down the bottom, mark as approved to make sure that you have at least got to move your eyes down to the bottom of the page. I unfortunately can't put matchsticks into people's eyes and make them read it, but I can make sure that they've scrolled to the bottom of the page. Uh, Giles asks, can the risk assessment be sent back to the originator for amendment? I wondered if anyone would spot that. So well spotted, but no, I haven't provided the button for that yet, but I will do as the system develops. So thank you very much for spotting it. Uh, but there will definitely be a no not checked or a no not approved option where it knocks it back down, uh, back down the ladder. Uh, so Mark is approved. Uh, and again, a pop up box will pop up to say, are you sure you wish to approve the risk assessment? The risk assessment will become the official version and will replace previous versions. So I'll press OK. And now, hey, presto, the risk assessment is in force and I can't change it now. I can't sneak in and after the incident has occurred and change what the risk assessment was. Here's the little data trail of who did all the creating, compiling, checking and approving. And as I said, there will be interlocking once I finish doing the demonstrations to make it so that the same person can't be um, uh, used in all four cases. It has to be a different person. But you can, of course, control that with permissions as well. If I go to the index page again, hopefully my um, risks will now appear here. Yes, in fact, they're in the top 20 risks. Uh, the risk to safety of passengers getting injured from waving, leaning out and waving their arms. And in fact, the financial and regulatory risks as well in the top uh, the top 20 uh, demo railway uh, risks. Now, having said that uh, that risk assessment has been checked and approved and I now can't make any changes to it, obviously that's not very good because I want to be able to uh, review the risk assessment after a period of time and, uh, and make changes to it every time I review it. Well, we don't change this risk assessment. When it comes to time to review it, we come up here to this option, start a new draft version. And you see at the moment we're on version one. If I go start a new draft version, the pop-up box will say, are you sure you wish to start a new version of this risk assessment? The new version will be draft and the current risk assessment will be the current one until the new version is checked. And perhaps I need to add and approved onto the end of that. So I'll press OK. 
And it's the same hazard. It still has a number 122, but this is the draft of version 2. So none of this is in force yet. It's an exact copy at the moment, but I can go and edit it as much as I like, change scores, change likelihoods, severities, control measures. But it won't actually affect this overall organization risk ranking uh, until I go through that checking and approving process again. And in fact, just to show, if I was to click on the hazard of passengers riding in goods brake vans, it even says up here, a new version of this risk assessment is in progress. Click. And if I'm in the, um, uh, in the draft version, the yellow bar is there the same as it was before. But because there is a current version this time, which there wasn't previously, because the previous version was the first version, I've got a link to see the current version. So if I click current version here, I am back on version one again, which is the one that's in force. And this means that every risk assessment that we ever create is stored in hops forever. So it doesn't matter what the risk assessment, uh, it doesn't matter what the risk assessment currently says, we can still look and see what it said six months ago or three months ago or whenever we're being asked to have a look at it. We've got that full sort of data uh, audit trail of what risk assessment was what, who did it, um, and at what point it was uh, checked and approved and, and brought into operation. Um, there's a couple of other little um, uh, peripheral uh, tools on here. Every risk assessment has an owner and the owner can be changed by clicking on this uh, change owner and there's all of the um, hazard groups. So if for some reason a risk assessment was going to move from uh, the workshop to the paint shop and that risk assessment was going to become the responsibility of the people in the paint shop instead, maybe there it's part of the same building and the uh, the fire safety responsibility has moved from the person in charge of the workshop to the person in charge of the paint shop, for example, then this is where the owner, the owning group of the risk assessment can be changed. And that's the link up there, change owner. Uh, any of the control measures can be clicked on. See, they've all got a little identity number that starts with a C and it will take you to a detailed page of that control measure. And when it was reviewed and when it's next due to be reviewed, which I'm afraid I haven't put in the um, date selection boxes for yet. Uh, whoops, but I will do. Uh, here is all the risk likelihoods reduced by this control measure. And here is all the impact severities reduced by this control measure. So this page is ideally designed that if once a year or once however frequently they come up for review, I have a look at my control measures, which are things I'm committing to do to reduce the likelihood or severity of risks arising and check that they remain effective. So I could look at this and I could say, um, I'm going to review the control measure C3, the detail of which is levers are to be maintained properly by the catering department. OK, they're going to be maintained by the catering department. And I could say, well, are we still doing that? And if we are, then we're quite happy. We will eventually, when I provide you with a button, mark it as reviewed and move on to the next one. But if we think to ourselves, oh, my goodness me, no, actually, we're not maintaining the levers properly. We stopped doing that two months ago. Oh, my goodness me. Which risks are now not being properly mitigated? Well, if I click on the control measure, it takes me to that page I was on again that shows me that all the risks and all the impacts are all to do with this hazard of use of the water boiler um, and the risk arising of scalding and its impact on safety. Uh, so I'm really. Um, I really think that HOPS adds value in terms of the management of control measures of having them all here in one list with review dates and that sort of unbreakable link between the control measure and which risks they are uh, mitigating. And that is incidentally the reason why when we come to input control measures, we don't just type in maintenance or training or public liability insurance because it's highly likely that many risks are going to be mitigated by the same control measure. And so by selecting them from the list, it allows them to be brought together for the purpose of review and the purpose of knowing which risks are, are mitigated by them on pages like this. Whereas if I just typed in assess footplate crew in 22 different places in the system, it would make it difficult for me to find, uh, find all the places where I'd used it uh, if I need to. You can get to that list of control measures page, incidentally, from the, the home page. Here we are on that control measures tab. There it is. Right, where am I? Whoops. Also from this uh, home page, 
uh, we were on risk assessment index. The next tab is a list of all the hazards, and this is where the if it ever loads, this is where the new hazard uh, link is. So when we're adding new risk assessments in, we start with a hazard. This is where we come and add them. And you notice on both of these pages, for both controlled and uncontrolled, is the summary totals for uh, for each of the impacts. And if I click on any of them, it'll show me in a very verbose page how mathematically that was arrived at with all the detail. This activity occurs once per calendar day, which is one times 365, so 365 equivalent annual exposures. Its uncontrolled likelihood is 1%. And its uncontrolled severity is 1, so 365 times 1% 1 times 1 divided by 100 is 0 0.04. So if we needed to get into the detail of how these numbers were arrived at mathematically, then anywhere in the system where the numbers appear, it'll be a link and you can click on it and it'll tell you how the number was arrived at. Similarly, wherever we see these parties affected, we can click on one of them and it'll show us all of the hazards that impact on, in this case, passengers. We can also get to that list by going from the home page here to the risks by parties affected tab and clicking on the parties affected that we want to look at. And all of the headings are sortable, so I can sort it to get the highest safety risks at the top or bottom or the, uh, uh, the highest controlled financial risks at the top or the bottom, whichever way up I want to arrange it. Incidentally, if anything comes out as a zero, that means it hasn't been scored and it goes red. So that's to draw your attention to the fact that uh, that hasn't been scored. It's not a true zero. Um, uh, and that's why it's got a red background on it. Apart from that dark red background, you get to specify what the color boundaries are uh, for each of the, the range of outcomes. So you can see we've only got green and yellow on that page, um, but I think it goes green, yellow, orange, red. Hopefully you might um, agree that the scoring that I give in the examples here, where it's roughly on a score magnitude of 1 to 2,000, um, is appropriate. And then the, um, the colour bands might be 1 to 100, 100 to 500, 500 to 1,000 and over 1,000. But if you choose that you do want to do 1, 10, 20 and 50 and just have it on a magnitude of 1 to 50, then those colour boundaries will obviously need to come down a little bit. Uh, so where was I? Risk assessment index, that was the home page. List of all the hazards on the second tab. And you can click on uh, any of the headings, any of the scores, any of the hazards to be taken to the detail of that score or impact or parties affected or hazard. There was the list of control measures on the next tab and when they're going to be reviewed. Risk by parties affected, which gave us a list of um, the... Uh, oh, there are none which gave us a list of the hazards affecting each of these parties affected. There's the passenger ones. Similarly, we can get a list of risks by impact area. And this is really uh, useful and really um, uh, relevant to the context of a volunteer um, heritage organization, which is we just did a risk assessment as a guard and somebody else might have done a risk assessment as a signalman and somebody else might have done a risk assessment as, a, as an admin clerk. Excuse me, but they'll all have safety impacts. They'll all have financial impacts. They'll all have regulatory impacts. This is where I come as a director, as the director of safety to say, right, I don't care where the risk assessment came from. I just want to see everything that relates to safety. So it doesn't matter whether it's a signalman risk or a driving risk or a passengers in brake bands risk. I just want to see everything that relates to safety. And again, I can sort it here to get the top risks by uncontrolled or the top risks by controlled or even sort it into parties affected within this um, uh, safety impact area. If I'm the director of safety, I don't really care about the financial risks or the environmental risks. I just want to see my safety risks here. And if I'm the finance director, I only want to see the finance risks. Uh, and you can control with permissions who has the ability to see and edit what. So there's all the finance risks. In this one, the risk of running out of coal would be really high. In the safety one, the risk of running out of coal would be really low. And then the last two tabs, which we have already looked at, the definitions and settings. There's all the definitions of, of how um, the structure in HOPS of the risk assessment system has been built up. Let's just see if there's any we haven't um, already discussed. Hazard groups, the grouping of hazards to mirror the teams responsible for conducting the risk assessments. 
a hazard or activity, a title of an item or a task or activity that exists that has the potential to present risks. So a hazard or activity could be oil or steam gala or uneven surface in car park or an activity such as use of chainsaws. Uh, the risk is something generally undesirable that could result from the existence of a hazard, i.e. oil gives risk to the rise of spillage, or steam gala gives rise to the risk of overcrowding, or uneven surface in the car park gives rise to the risk of damage to vehicles. All risks are born out of a hazard, so every risk belongs to a hazard, and a hazard may have one or many associated risks. The exposure is how frequently the hazard or activity occurs, and it's measured in the number of occurrences per a unit, i.e. x times per day or x times per visitor. So for the hazard of train evacuation, the exposure is how frequently does a train evacuation occur? So maybe once every 20 years. Or for units of time, these are, sorry, for units of time, these are silently converted into years to give the hops hars risk scores consistently on a per year basis. All the outcome scores are per year. For non-time units, each organisation specifies separately how many times those exposure units occur so that risk calculations can be normalised back to a consistent HARS annual score. Remember we said here in the exposure settings that if I said that an exposure was once per operating day, if I came back here now in 2020 and said, well, we're not going to operate for 220 days this year, we're going to operate for about 50, uh, and pressed save, then those risk scores would change that downwards that were proportional to how many um, operating days we were going to have. And maybe some of the other ones would therefore, without changing their score, become proportionally uh, more important. Uh, tra -la -la, where are we? Uh, likelihood, it's fairly straightforward. The likelihood of a risk occurring when the hazard occurs. So we are presuming that the hazard is there. What is the likelihood of the risk occurring? If the exposure of the hazard is really low or really high, that doesn't matter. It's the likelihood of the risk occurring when the hazard occurs. So to use our example again, for the hazard of train evacuation and the risk of people falling off ladders, the likelihood is how likely is it that someone will fall off a ladder when a train is evacuated, which might well be one person out of 200, not the number of people who will fall off ladders over the course of a year, which will be much lower as trains are so rarely evacuated. The likelihood is scored once for the risk, as the likelihood does not change based on the impact. So if you notice, I only got to specify the likelihood once, whereas I got to specify the severity separately for each impact. So the severity is the next definition, the severity of the impact of the risk when it occurs on each of the impact areas and is scored separately for each impact area. And if you remember here in the uh, impact areas and severity values tab, this is where we specify what those severity values are. And you can have as many or as few of them as you like. Uh, parties affected, a group of people who are exposed to the risks arising from the hazard. And if you remember at the start, I said that we did find pretty quickly that um, it was useful to break that down into the individual roles that volunteers do on the railway rather than just having one that said staff, um, because it enables us to have a look here in this tab at the risk by parties affected and get all the risks for signalmen and then print that list off and give it to the signalmen and say, these are the risks that we found that are relevant to you um, for you to be aware of and share, or even just give people permission to see it in hops, give signalmen permission to see it in hops. But sharing what you found in the outputs of your risk assessment is really important to the management of risk. Uh, impact area, an area of harm to which the risk is allocated, i.e. safety, financial, PR, environmental, a risk impact a risk may impact in one or many impact areas, and impact areas are designed to match the responsible director or senior manager areas of responsibility in order to facilitate that hierarchical analysis of risk that um, is so appropriate to the context of a heritage railway. The HAAS score, the HOPS annual risk score, a numerical value that represents the risk. HAAS scores are all scaled to be annual in order to keep a consistent scoring scale across all risks. Otherwise, the sorting would not be valid. The HAAS score is produced from the annualised exposure to the hazards, multiplied by the likelihood of each risk occurring when the hazard occurs, multiplied by the severity of the impact when the risk occurs, and then just divided by 100 to make the numbers manageable, to give you numbers like 4 and 20 rather than 400 and 2,000. 
Uh, by including the exposure in this calculation, resultant scores are scaled to a per year value called the HOPS annual risk score, and the division by 100 is just to scale the results to manageable numbers without altering their relative ranking. Uncontrolled, the scoring of the risk before the application of control measures, and controlled is the scoring of risk after the application of control measures. And a control measure is an item or task in place to reduce the likelihood of a risk occurring or its severity when it does. I am aware that quite often in risk assessments, um, control measures that reduce um, likelihood are called control measures and control measures that reduce severity are called mitigation measures. But I've just called them control measures in hops to be uh, to make it a little bit simpler. But control measures can separately be added to reduce impact or they can separately be added to reduce uh, severity. And in HOPS, all control measures are identified by a number prefix with a C. Uh, and accepted is for impacts above a certain score, which are accepted by the director or senior manager responsible for the impact area, which I haven't programmed yet. But if I come here into a risk assessment, you'll see here down the side, the acceptance shows not accepted. And what I'm working on at the moment is that if a risk uh, breaks a certain threshold, that the director or the person with permission responsible for the impact area in which it occurs will have to explicitly uh, go in and give their rationale as to why they're prepared to accept the risk. Now, we could get rid of all risks by closing the business completely and never running any trains and never having any customers. But that's not reasonably practicable to do if we want to continue to run our business. So a lot of risks have to just be accepted. We have to do everything reasonably uh, possible that we can with control measures to reduce them. But then eventually we have to accept that final score. And sometimes that final score might be quite high, like the risk of getting burned on a, a steam locomotive footplate. We can put as many control measures as we like in, but eventually we just have to accept the residual risk that there is still a chance a driver or fireman could get burned on a footplate. So having the opportunity and acceptance there for the director responsible for the safety impact area to write in the rationale of why they've uh, seen it appropriate to accept that risk makes it a lot easier to defend later if that risk assessment is ever called into question. <clears throat> now, as I said right at the start, the risk assessment system is relatively new in HOPS. And normally I like to let things bed in a little bit more um, before I uh, sort of encourage everyone to use them. But a lot of people latched onto the risk assessment system and were very keen for it to be um, developed. Uh, so that's why I have uh, got it to the stage that I have and I've put it out for use and why I'm doing the video now. The shape of it in the future, much like uh, everything in HOPS, is very much up to you. And I'd very much like you to feedback as you use the risk assessment system on what you find useful and where you think it should develop and what other little tools and facilities that you think it should have. But I think you'll agree that this risk assessment system is somewhat more comprehensive than a five by five matrix. And I would like to think that this risk assessment system is actually assessing risk and giving a uh, meaningful numerical output and is appropriate to use if we want to really assess risk and know where the risks are and what priority we should give to uh, maintaining them rather than a system whereby we want to use it just so that we can say we have done a risk assessment. And I think it came out pretty early in the discussions um, that I had with a number of HOPS admins about this system, that distinction between doing a risk assessment because we want to assess risk and doing a risk assessment because we want to have done a risk assessment. And this is definitely a system for assessing that risk. I hope this has been a useful video. If you've got any queries or comments, please write them in the in the comments in the next 10 seconds, because otherwise we'll end. So this is your last opportunity. I uh, The risk assessment system comes in advanced hops, in SLS hops. So if you're not an SLS customer yet, then you might not be able to, to see the risk assessment system. But if you want to have a play with it, then please let me know and I'll arrange a little trial period for you so that you can have a play with the risk assessment system um, and any of the other features that are available in advanced hops to see whether you like them before you uh, commit to going any further. Um, but otherwise, if you're already an advanced hops customer, an SLS customer, all of the permissions that you need are already available in uh, in HOPS and you can allocate them uh, to your users. I'll just quickly find them for you. Uh, whoops. Here they are. And you can see they're all gold. They're all advanced ones. 
So here are the permissions. I'll just quickly go through these to give you a last couple of minutes to write any uh, questions if you have them. Uh, the permission to view risk assessments, which is broken down by hazard group, and edit risk assessments, which is broken down by hazard group, and check the risk assessments by hazard group, and approve the risk assessments by hazard group. So that's that four-step process that we went through. Hopefully you might see it appropriate to allow view risk assessments on quite a wide basis in the organisation, but obviously editing and checking and approving are management roles that the permission should be um, allocated accordingly. Adding new control measures and editing existing ones. Remember, we said that if a control measure is added to a risk assessment, the organization is committing to provide it. So we might want to control a little bit who has permission to add new control measures uh, to the system. Risk assessment settings edit, which is a red dagger permission, so a very senior permission, only really either the HOPS admin or the safety manager um, should have this. This is the permission for um, editing the hazard groups list and the parties affected and the um, impact um, scores. And then finally, viewing a list of hazards by parties affected and viewing a list of hazards by impact area. And this will be the permission for accepting the risk assessments by impact area that we spoke about right at the end, uh, which is the thing that's in process at the moment, where if a uh, controlled risk score is above a certain threshold, there'll be the opportunity for the director responsible for that impact area to accept it and provide a uh, rationale as to, to why it's being accepted, even though it's still quite high. OK, I think that's pretty much all I can think of to say about the risk assessment system. Thank you very much, everyone, for tuning in. As I said a second ago, it is very much uh, an, an early beta release um, of the system. So please do let me have your feedback because that's the only way that Hops develops and grows is when you let me know uh, what you like and what you don't like and how you think it would be useful um, if things uh, developed. So I hope to see you all again soon. Thanks for tuning in and good night.